Hello, so this is a follow-up video gear list for my successful through paddle of the Northern Forest Canoe Trail, which I did this past May of 2021. So I have videos out that talk about my gear list and what I was planning to use, and this is a follow-up talking about what worked and what didn't. So this video talks about the clothing and the camping equipment. There's a second video they have that talks more about the canoeing and portaging setup. So if you want to check out that video, check out the description. I'll link it down there. Let's start off with my major sleep and shelter systems. So I wouldn't change anything about this. Everything here worked really, really well. The tent was perfect, lightweight, really easy to set up, kept me dry in all the rain that I had. Uh, I wouldn't change a thing. There was a couple times that I had to set up on a beach or a tent platform or something like that, and it just made life a lot easier. So I'm glad I brought a freestanding tent. The sleeping mat here, again, very, very comfortable, 25 inches wide, so I sleep a little bit better on it. That's my go-to mat right now, so that worked very well. You can see that I just use a little piece of, like a bungee with a cord lock on it, and that's how I keep it all rolled up. I don't bother with the stuff sack for it. And I keep the trash bag inflator that I used to inflate it inside of it too, which that held up the whole time too. The Nemo Philo Pillow. Is extremely comfortable. I did not regret having it. I had enough space and didn't mind the little bit of extra weight. It only weighs a little bit more than my sort of backpacking one. And then this is a lot more comfortable. And the sleeping bag, I was, I'm certainly glad that I brought one that's as warm as it is. So this is a 20 degree sleeping bag made by Western Mountaineering called the Alpen Light. The coldest that my trip got was closer towards the end, even though it was later in the spring, but it was when I was in Chisuncook, uh, and it got below freezing at night, and that's the only time of the entire trip that it was actually below freezing, but it got down to the low 30s a whole bunch of times, so I was very glad that I had this. If I was to do it all over again, I would probably still bring the sleeping bag. There was a couple nights, maybe two or three, that I wished that I was a little bit warmer than I was, but I still had plenty of layers that I could have put on. And I don't sleep in a lot of clothes. I don't generally like to sleep in base layers unless I have to. So most of the time I didn't. So that is a pretty good target temperature range to shoot for if you're considering doing something like this in the in the early spring. Like again, my trip was in May, so it's pretty early in the year. I don't have a lot to say about my cook kit. It worked exactly how it was supposed to. The pot was a good size for all the backpacking style food that I did. The mug there is nice because you can reheat it on the stove if you do a hot drink. And the little stove itself worked really well too. I've used that on multiple trips as well. So everything that you see here, I would bring with me next time too. This Catadyne B-Free filter was definitely the right choice for my style of trip. It was extremely convenient during the day with that blue filter and going to this little small squeeze style bottle that just stayed out in the canoe and anytime i was thirsty i could just dump it in the water and just drink this was a great setup uh, the dirty bladder there and the clean bladder there made it so i could carry a ton of water if i had to which sounds kind of silly like why would you have to carry a ton of water on a canoe trip right well there was times especially in vermont where they just don't recommend using the water because of agriculture so a couple times in vermont two mornings in a row actually i went to a gas station and filled up with potable water the clean bladder, four liters, the dirty bladder here with three liters. So I was able to bring seven liters of water with me, which is an enormous amount of water, which uh, these areas, there wasn't a ton of portaging. So it worked out. I could just leave them in the, the canoe pretty much the entire time. So I was really glad to have that kind of capacity. If you just had one or two liters, those days might be tough. You might actually have to buy like a gallon jug or something. So this just is perfect for canoe camping trip. If you haven't tried a gravity style, filter system for canoe camping. Um, give it a whirl. I think you probably will bring it every time. Moving on to sort of accessories and kind of tools and miscellaneous things. These are a few of the things that I pulled out. I, I didn't want to grab everything out since it's unpacked and put it all out in front of me again, but these are a few things of note that I figured I'd talk about. So the sunglasses, which were Costa Tuna Alley model sunglasses, were great. They stopped the glare really well. They helped wind fishing. They were comfortable. Um, the, the sad thing was the very last night of the trip, I was in a diner of all things at uh, Norm's Pelletier's campground, which is most people's last night. There's a diner that's right down the road. 
So I was in there for dinner and I was wearing my sunglasses on the top of my hat and I went to adjust my hat as I was leaving the diner and they fell off and hit the floor, not very hard, but enough to crack one of the glass lenses. So it was a huge bummer. They survived everything that was the normal part of the trip, except for me not being able to keep them from breaking in a restaurant. They're not, they're still usable, but it was really kind of a bummer. And it just made me realize too, for a really long trip, it might be best if you had the option to not bring glass lenses because they are much more fragile. But they worked really well. They're very good quality glasses. It's just a bummer that they can break potentially so easily. The bug net, I'm sure there are lots of people that need bug nets. I went in May and the bugs just weren't out. It, it was too cold for them still. So that is something that if I had a magic crystal ball, I wouldn't have brought, although it's so light and takes up so, so little room that I would probably still pack it if I was to do it again. I wasn't sure what the bugs would be like. This multi-tool is a, is a full-size Leatherman. It was kind of overkill for what I needed. I, I didn't end up using any of the tools on it. Uh, I'm a huge fan of a different multi-tool, which is a lot smaller that I usually use in backpacking trips, called the Gerber Dime. So this is much, much smaller. And it has all the tools on it that I really want. It has a bottle opener on the outside. It has a small knife, very small. It has a package opener, which is a little sharp um, secondary knife, which is nice because you don't get any kind of adhesive or anything from tape on your other blade if you want to use that for opening food packaging or something like that. Still has pliers and it has scissors as well. So this would have been perfectly fine. I didn't have to do lots of crazy repairs. So in hindsight, I would have brought something smaller like this. Here's the two tools side by side to give you an idea and comparison of how, how different they are in terms of their size. If you are using a bunch of equipment that you think you may have to repair because it's already tired and seen multiple trips, or you just want to be really cautious, there's nothing wrong with bringing a very versatile tool like the big one on the left. However, from my backpacking experience and after doing this trip, the little tool here would have sufficed and it would have saved quite a bit of weight. So that's probably one thing I would do different myself. Moving on to sort of waterproof bags and, and storage and convenience and things. I didn't end up using this thing very much here. My thought was that I would use it in the canoe all the time for snacks and, and things of that sort. But this is so thin that I was afraid of damaging it. So most of the time it just lived in its little stuff sack. I did use this a couple times in town as just a backpack to go in and kind of resupply and things like that, where that's probably where I used it the most. But what I found pretty quickly on this trip was that I wanted something that was waterproof that could be in the boat that I had access to that was more durable than this. What I ended up doing pretty early on was buying another small dry bag. And this is what I would keep my rain gear in, my food for the day, my electronics when it started to kind of rain and I wanted to have them in something a little bit more secure. If I was doing any kind of quick water and I wanted to take just a whole bunch of the little miscellaneous things and put them into something that would float and keep them dry should I flip, this was what I went to. I really, really recommend bringing more than just one gigantic dry bag. That enormous dry bag right there is so big that it's almost impossible to open up and kind of dig through while in a solo canoe, at least for me. It, it just makes things really unstable and it's a chore. So I didn't really do that much. And like I said, my plan was to use this thin ultralight dry bag pack for that purpose. But I found out pretty quick that I wanted something more durable and convenient. So that smaller bag there I picked up in Saranac Lake and used it every single day. This is something I would recommend considering for your secondary dry bag if you're trying to do a, a similar trip to me, like, as I did rather. So this here is kind of a blend between a full-fledged heavy-duty dry bag and the ultralight packable style. It has a lot of features on it. It has water bottle pockets on the sides, compression straps for making it smaller, a zipper pocket on the front for organizing smaller kinds of things, but it's still a roll top closure dry bag and it packs down really, really small because it doesn't have a frame. So when you're not using this thing for, for the really big portages where you don't want to deal with another backpack, 
it would fit really easily inside of your dry bag if you took everything out and were able to repack it, as long as it's room in your, your main dry bag. If I was to do this again, is I would use a slightly smaller dry bag than this. Again, in my situation, being in a north wind solo canoe, this just was a little bit too big. I had to pack it differently until I found a system that made it so I could fit everything into the canoe. Uh, mainly what it was was the this dry bag is big enough that I could lay my tent down sideways, and the poles made it so it didn't fit inside the canoe well. It got stuck on the gunnels, and I was trying to take it in and out. And it actually started wearing out little holes in the bottom of the dry bag really quickly on. Uh, like in, By day three, I actually had a small hole, and I was stunned that it could go through that black material on the bottom that quickly. And it was from the tent poles, which didn't damage the inside of the tent bag somehow, but they were able to wear little holes in the bottom of this thing. So after that, I started packing all my stuff vertically, and I still had a ton of room, and it, it made it a lot easier to fit with that little solo canoe. But that's probably about enough on that. But I would take a 90 liter or somewhat, something smaller than this one and this bag here as my secondary bag because this th that combination can do everything that I have these three bags for. The electronics did very well this trip. I was extremely impressed with that big blue battery bank, that Zender Super Tank battery. I can't believe how, the, how fast that thing charges and how many devices and things you can charge off of it. With the kind of the heavier wall charger, that sort of bulky, kind of pricey and heavy uh, wall charger there, with a, an appropriate cable, it can't just use anything. It has to be rated for very high charging capacities, like that black cable there. It can charge in less than three hours. I, I was saying two hours before. Reality is probably closer to somewhere between two and three, but by three hours, even if it was completely dead, it'd be back to full, which is amazing. I charged it just the other day where I was using it on a, a different short camping trip. And I charged just off my computer because I already had a plug right there and just was convenient. So I didn't grab this wall charger and cable and I plugged it into the USB port of my computer. And it took probably about 24 hours to charge from about 15% back to full at the computer's output, which is five watts maximum. And this black cable there and that white box can charge at 100. And Electricity doesn't work in perfect math, but it is, you could say, close to 20 times faster, whereas that just can charge that much quicker when you have that kind of output. So it's certainly worth having some kind of high capacity charger and cable for any kind of uh, battery bank that you have. You can charge it a lot faster than just a regular wall plug or your computer or something. Everything in here worked out really well, too. I had the Garmin InReach Mini with me, and that was handy to be able to kind of talk and communicate in areas that didn't have service too, especially the Allagash coordinating the end of the trip. Here's a few more things that uh, I realized pretty quickly on in the trip I wasn't using very much to at all. So this banana looking thing is a floating lanyard for my sunglasses. It was just uncomfortable when it rested on the back of my neck. I didn't lose my sunglasses. I may have broken them in a diner, but I didn't ever have them plop into the water. So that was something that on paper would be really nice. It just didn't feel nice how it rested on my neck, so I didn't use it. I mailed it home pretty quick. The microphone, that tripod, and the phone holder, that red thing on the right there, every, I'm very new to making videos in general, so I thought that I'd want something like tripody that could pick up good volume and hold the phone stable and everything. So these are the pieces of equipment I selected. But what I realized very early on was that I just didn't have the, the time of the day or the battery capacity, really, to be shooting lots of videos of me filming myself doing things. I started off doing a little bit of that in New York, and it was incredible how fast it drained my battery. This is my bear hanging kit. It worked really well. So I would certainly recommend that everybody bring some kind of way to properly store their food. Bears aren't super likely to come and try to take your food. However, if you feed the bear, even by accident, it's horrible for the bear. It starts to associate people food and camping with delicious high calorie food. And before you know it, you might've gotten that bear killed because it starts raiding campsites and eventually becomes too aggressive. You're much more likely to keep mice from chewing your food, honestly, than, than bears by hanging it up, but it just helps make sure your food stays for you and it helps keep wildlife wild. Let's start off with the rain gear. So the NRS Storm Surge, which is the blue raincoat in the center, that worked out really well. I liked it 
a lot. The arms were really nice and long, so that way with all the paddling, the jacket didn't really interfere. The wrists do tighten down pretty good too, so it makes it easier to keep water from getting up your sleeve. The rain hat, the Outdoor Research Seattle Sombrero, I did wear that whenever it was raining hard enough that I wanted something covering my head instead of a hood. In the beginning of the trip in New York, I was paddling on, a, on the worst day of rain I had. It was just a pretty heavy rain all day long, and I was using the hood of the jacket. And partway through the day, I started getting shoulder pain, and I thought it was muscular. I thought it was like from paddling and fatigue. But what I realized after portaging when I took the hood off was that as soon as the hood wasn't on anymore, it didn't hurt. So I <laughs> took the hood off, took out the rain hat, and I felt completely fine for the rest of the day. So I, I guess I didn't realize how big of a difference that could make until I experienced it. So I would certainly bring the rain hat again. These paddling gloves I didn't wear once. It just wasn't cold enough. To put it in perspective, the last time I needed to use those gloves was a whitewater canoeing course that I took in March when there was snow on the ground. And that's what I used with my dry suit in that really cold water. So I was afraid of having really cold hands. In hindsight, I, I wouldn't bring them again if I was to do it again. For layers, this is the Arcteryx Atom AR. I only wore this one time, and it was on the morning of the coldest morning of my trip, which was in the, the town of Jasunkuk. It got a little bit below freezing. There was frost and a little bit of ice that morning when I woke up, which was kind of funny because the hottest point of the entire trip was the day before, so it was a giant swing. It was up to the 89 degrees at Lobster Lake. This jacket being synthetic and for how warm it is for how small it packs down, I would probably bring the same jacket again. If I was going later in the season, like I would have preferred to if I didn't have obligations, I would bring something like this, a synthetic jacket, but a little bit lighter. So this would be a little bit heavier than I would need if I went in, say, June or, or later. The Squamish hoodie here, which is a wind jacket, and this Patagonia R1, those are kind of my tried and true staples for my layers. I would start off every morning when I got a really early start with both of them on. So I'd start off with my t-shirt, my wool t-shirt. Then I would put on these two as layers with a hat and I would start off for the day. And as the sun came up and I got moving, I would eventually shed the wind jacket and then the R1 once it was closer to noon most days. Or if it was really windy, I would take off the R1 and put the Squamish back on. But those two pieces there were fantastically perfect for what I needed, so I would certainly bring those two again. For the base layers, I would bring both of these pieces again. They're the lightest weight tops and bottoms base layers that I have. They're both synthetic, so they dry really fast. I didn't wear these once the entire time. I did get a quite a bit of rain, but most of the clothing I was wearing throughout the day would dry. I didn't get many days of rain in a row, so I just dealt with being a little bit wet. I would bring these again, but I didn't need for hat and gloves, I did add a last minute addition to what I brought. That blue cap up on the top is an Arcteryx warm winter hat. I used that all the time, so I'm glad that I brought that. I wish I had put that in my first packing gear list, but there was a lot of chilly mornings, including a day or two that were really low 30s or right around freezing, so it was nice to have that, especially for the mornings. The gloves I sent back when I got to Jackman because I hadn't needed them the whole time. I wish that I kept them because I had a cold spell come in right after I sent them home. For how small they are, I sent them home early. I wish I didn't. They're so small and light that I would bring gloves of that kind and warmth with me again, and I wouldn't send them home next time. And then I'm a huge fan of really thin wool beanie caps, like that icebreaker one. That's just so nice to be able to add and remove for just a quick um, temperature change. So that is something I, I would definitely bring. There's not a lot to say about socks and undergarments. They worked fine. Two pairs of boxer shorts for me was enough. I could certainly see most people wanting to bring uh, an extra pair or maybe more, but for me this, this worked. Here's another addition that I ended up bringing that didn't make my first video. That red shirt up there is a synthetic Patagonia base layer t-shirt, very thin. That was what I would wear whenever my clothes were in the laundry basically. And the same thing with these green pants. The only days I wore either of these two things was when I was in town or when I was doing laundry or both. Um, with weight not being such a big factor in this trip and both of those garments being pretty lightweight, I would bring them again, I think. 
they, they worked out fine for what they were. And that's a pair of smart little socks in the crew. I didn't wear these very much. They pretty much only were worn one or two nights when I had cold feet sleeping. My everyday wear clothing worked quite well for me. You can see it's a lot more sun faded than it was when I started. The baseball cap uh, definitely saw a lot of sun. It was nice to have. However, out of everything that I brought that I would have swapped out, a baseball cap is the first thing to go because I had so many problems with my ears getting sunburned, even putting sunscreen on them every day multiple times. So we'll get to what I would bring next time. But that cap is one of the things that just didn't provide enough coverage for me. Moving on here, this shirt was not in the everyday clothes pile in the first video, but this is an icebreaker merino wool t-shirt. And this is what I ended up wearing every single day. I'm just so used to these shirts. It's as comfortable as an everyday t-shirt at home. The material feels great. It dries quick. It's not stinky. All the wonderful things about wool. But that was my go-to shirt every day. I did try to wear this Arcteryx Elaho or Alaho, however you pronounce it. It was my first time trying to wear like a collared nylon shirt on a trip. And what really got me was how it felt when the sleeves were rolled up. There's buttons so you can roll up the sleeves. It was just too tight on my arm and I just didn't like the way that it felt. So these ended up getting mailed home pretty early on too. Same deal, boxer shorts worked just fine. Outdoor research for Rossi zip-offs, they were fantastic. Really, really comfy, good stretch, dried quickly enough, and a little bit more weather and wind protection than a thinner pan. Darn tough socks and the low cut was what I wore just about every single day. They worked great too. I was really impressed with, the, with these shoes. These are the Astral TR1s. These shoes did really, really well. Um, I, was, I was very impressed with how well they held up and how comfortable they were, as well as how dry uh, they would become in such a short amount of time. They worked out really well. I did use them with socks pretty much every single time. I, I never really went barefoot in them like a, like a water shoe. And they worked out great. I took them on... I have to do the math and figure out uh, as close to a, a real number of portage miles, especially like on-road portage miles that I did because I did so many more than absolutely necessary to avoid upriver travel as well as uh, rapids and things that I wasn't comfortable running. But I know that I did over 100 miles of portaging in these shoes, and they were great. I didn't get a single foot bluster the entire time. So those, those for me worked. I'm a big fan. They're going to be my go-to water shoes for a long time. And they worked really well for hiking, too. And um, other times that I would walk up to a fire tower, just walk around camp, they were very comfortable. They felt like hiking shoes. Another addition I started with were these waterproof ankle-cut um, hiking boots. These particular ones are the Astral Lone Peak 4 Mid Waterproof. I was concerned right before I was leaving that what if everything I had was wet? and I didn't want to be doing big long road portages with wet feet and wrist blisters and all that kind of stuff. So I wanted to bring something waterproof for camp. And it just turned out in my trip with the weather that I had, it, they weren't necessary. I wore them one or two times because I had them, but I never really needed them. So they got mailed home in Jackman too. And in hindsight, I wish I didn't start with them or I mailed them home sooner. They're great boots, but I, I didn't need them for this trip. So moving on to sort of my uh, cold water wading equipment. So first things first, the Orvis Ultralight Waders. I was glad that I had them when I used them, but I almost never used them. Again, kind of similar to what I was talking about with the Arcteryx puffy jacket. If I was doing this exact same trip again in an early May start with really cold water, I would probably bring these because they're so nice for when you're in waste ish deep water and you're kind of dragging the canoe over beaver dams and, and things like that or if you have to actually track up a big section of, of current. I found I really disliked the fighting of the current upstream. I, I know there's a novelty to it and that some people are really hardcore and, and they want to, to kind of go up river every time that the river goes up. I found I'd portage around it. I still did everything so like just solo myself. I didn't have any shuttles or anything like that. But I found myself almost always wanting to avoid the upriver paddling. It just felt like I'm being on a treadmill, that if you took a single break, you'd start going backwards. It just wasn't enjoyable, and I got frustrated by it. So I did most of the time walking on it. That being said, I could have gotten away just fine on this trip without those waders. The only time that 
I used them, that I was really glad to have them, was Little Spencer Stream. There was enough water in it that I was waiting most of the time. I didn't actually have to unload my canoe and lift it over anything the whole time. I've seen pictures of that, that section this year after I did it, and it was you would not be able to do what I did. So they were great for that. But if it was a little bit warmer, I would have been fine with maybe just a bathing suit and just getting wet and just dragging stuff up the stream that way. These mid-weight pants here are a material called Power Stretch. I didn't use these at all. I ended up sending them home pretty early. My concern was being in the waders a lot. If I was cold standing in the water a lot, and because I wasn't in the waders in the water very much, these pants there just wasn't a need for. Um, doing the same trip over again, for all the same criteria, I would not bring those. And then the last thing to talk about here are the Sims ultralight boots and the socks that my dog's lying on. The boots, they're very similar to the waders. I wouldn't bring just one or the other because the waders need something. Boots and the boots by themselves aren't what I would need for this kind of trip. They worked really well together. The wading socks, which you can't really see good, they look just like the booties and the, the waders there, but they're not attached. The time where these really shone was the mud stream or the mud pond carry, that big portage. I did wear the waders and these boots for that, and that was the time that these boots really shined. Because that portage was not as bad as a lot of pictures as I saw, but it was still very goopy. However, if I was in water shoes and it wasn't terribly cold out, I could have been fine with just kind of getting a pair of water shoes and socks just disgusting and washing them out in the water on the other side. I don't feel like I need these waders and these boots for that portage. So the wading socks, I don't think I used them a single time. The only time I ever wore these wading boots were four times that I was wearing the waders. And every once in a great while, if I got to a random beaver dam that I had to get over, but I didn't want to get my everyday wear shoes wet. Sometimes I'd throw these on real quick just to step out of the, the boat real quick on top of the beaver dam and, and drag over it. But going, if to make a, to make this long, there's, there's, there we go. Perfect. That's what they look like. But um, in hindsight, like in conclusion, in hindsight, this whole setup right here was a better safe than sorry kind of thing. And if I was doing the trip again, I probably wouldn't bring this stuff. I would probably come up with, with some different kind of system to save weight and space and things. All this stuff combined is quite a few pounds for a kit that is not terribly heavy. So this, I could probably do without all of these. Okay, so now for the, the fun stuff. What do I wish that I started with that I didn't have? Well, there's two things that jump out to me more than anything else, and they're, they're right here. The first one I did not bring with me, but I wish that I did, is a very simple sweat headband. It doesn't have to be a buff band or anything like that, but something that dries fast that you can wear on your head. Because I found that enough of the portages that I did, I was covered in sweat. And it was cold when I did this too, mind you. It was basically the month of June, so and, and I was up pretty far north. I was still sweating like crazy. I can only imagine if it was hot July or August or something. And when you've got a canoe up over your head and you've got a heavy dry bag on your back and you're carrying over 100 pounds of stuff on a rough hiking trail that you can't use a portage cart on, at least I sweat a ton. You probably will too. So having something that would keep the sweat from dripping into my eyes when I can't wipe it away because I'm carrying a canoe would have been huge. Even just a bandana would have been better, but I didn't have one of those either. So that that's what I would bring for that. I use that all the time on my backpacking trips. I don't know why I didn't think of it. And then this was critical. If there was any single one thing that I regret not starting off with, it's a full brim sun hat. My ears were getting so sunburnt that they would bleed. I would, I would reach and rub my ear because it hurt and my finger would come away with a little bit of blood from being so sunburnt. And I was using SPF 50 sunscreen multiple times a day. Every single morning I would put some on and I still got cooked with my ears. I burn very easy, it's something I know. That's why I bring a lot of sun protective stuff and, and such strong sunscreen. But still, it wasn't enough. A baseball cap and sunscreen for me did not work. I couldn't recommend bringing a full brim hat enough. This one's really nice. It has the kind of vents on the actual upper part of the cap that the wind can kind of blow through. And the brim was really nice for keeping the sun and light rain and stuff out of my eyes. This would work particularly well with the bug net because it would keep the net off of your shoulders. It'd be more comfortable and it'd keep bugs from biting through the net if it was resting up against your skin. The bugs weren't bad for me. I was very lucky I didn't need to use the bug net at all, but this would have been a great addition to that. 
One last thing that I would bring with me if I was to do this all over again is a dedicated water shoe, something that's made to get wet that dries really fast. So these are some Vivo Barefoot minimalist shoes. You can see they're honeycomb. You can see right through them. It's like a plasticky, foamy material everywhere. These dry almost instantly. You can just shake them off and they don't, they don't absorb any water except for the little laces on top. When I would have liked to use these is when I had to hop out of the canoe really quick just to drag over a beaver dam because I, I found myself once or twice actually breaking my own rules and doing it barefoot, which is a bad idea. That's all it takes is to cut a foot and then end a trip or just make the rest of the trip miserable when you're portaging for dozens of miles. So this would have worked great for that. It was, it was very cold when I went. I only took two baths and it was freezing. It was kind of like get in, get cleanish and get out. But if it was warmer and I could swim more, I would definitely swim with these on too. And they're very light and they pack down. So this would be a good addition as well. Okay, so that sums it up for the clothing and camping equipment that I used and how it worked out for me. Thank you so much for watching.